Cirque du Soleil. How indeed does uh, a world encompassing uh, industry, it's now become an industry, stay true to its mission. Andrew Watson is going to come up here from the Cirque to tell us how he manages that particular balancing act. Andrew, Andrew was an acrobat, an actual working acrobat who found his way to the Cirque and now yep. is responsible for launching all the new Cirque shows, yep. keeping the existing ones in good shape. No, I, I was doing that before and I'm not working with the existing shows anymore. Ah, I was working with the, the, new the touring ones. shows and... Uh, and spotting all the new talent. Uh, spotting a new talent, but more interestingly, I think um, about a year ago, about a year ago, I was in London working on a fabulous project, the Millennium Film Project, which I'm sure you all heard about. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to go back home. In fact, I hadn't been home for a long time. And Guy Laliberté came to uh, came to London because we were he was looking to uh, work in Battersea Power Station and invited me to come back to Canada. I don't know if uh, I should sit and continue. Or, That's uh, well, yeah. right. Why don't you yeah. carry it away? The stage is yours. <laughs> See, I wasn't going to start there. Um, I started in circus. Um, I was invited to speak here a little while ago. And uh, ever since then, I don't speak publicly. Uh, I was a trapeze artist, and uh, we don't speak. <laughs> uh, apart from shout heads up. Um, uh, also with our shows, as I don't know if you've seen our shows, um, they're non-verbal and uh, a, vis a visual performance. Um, so what I thought I would like to, to speak about to start with, um, as opposed to just speaking about the Cirque du Soleil, um, would be my start in, in circus in England in 1984 and why I fell in love with um, circus and had the opportunity to, to, to coin a phrase, to run away with the circus, and what it meant to me and uh, how it touched me, uh, and then to move on to the Cirque. Um, in 1984, <coughs> February and March 1984, I was working in an office in London. I had the fantastic work of being an import buyer for a commercial stationery company. <laughs> it's a likely start. And um, <clears throat> on Saturdays, I had a friend who was going down the Portobello Road, <clears throat> and um, he started fire-eating and busking. And uh, so I was going down there on Saturdays and panhandling for him. And I decided, well, I would like to learn this also. So I learned a tiny little bit of this, and then shortly afterwards, saw an advertisement in the stage, um, a British theatrical newspaper, for Britain's first circus school. So I promptly, I went off to an audition, um, and when I, I walked into the, a barn <coughs> where there were many people auditioning, and saw um, everybody auditioning on the different apparatus and knew at one stroke that this is what I wanted to do. And promptly went to see the director and said, I would like to audition. He said, well, what can you do? And I said, I can fire it. And he said, everybody can do that. There was not a, not a very good start at all, so he said, I'm sorry. You know, so I went away and came back and went away and came back. And fina finally he said, well, what else can you do? And I grew up in the country, so I said, I can drive a tractor uh, and a trailer. And uh, I think he thought at this point, and, and I said, if you give me the chance to do this, I know that I'm going to be able to do it. And so he said, well, go and get a contract. And so I thought, great. I mean, I afterwards realized that um, he realized that if I didn't make it as an artist, I'd be great at putting up, uh, putting up and down the tent and driving the trucks. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so off I went, and I got my contract. It was one page and one paragraph. I belonged to him for 30 pounds a week. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a week later, I was there. I was living in a bunk wagon, uh, gave up my apartment and everything, living in a bunk wagon, getting my 30 pounds a week. And uh, we had five weeks training, and then we went out on the road. Now, I started at this point, I mean, the circus was all, always a curiosity to me, and very exotic because of the different nationalities, and I started meeting some of the people who I would work with. Apart from the 14 civilians, as you can call them in England, they call them jossers, 
there was Victor and Victor, uh, two Romanians. There was the, uh, the Flying Marlboros, who are an American trapeze act who uh, smoke Marlboros too. <laughs> and there were the Santos family, who uh, there were five sons, who, and they traveled in their caravans for generations. They traveled with the grandparents, um, one who died when we, were, when we were on the road, in fact, and was, had the, the service in the tent. And they had a bird that used to live in the caravan when they were um, on site and used to fly and follow them in between the cities. I thought it was marvelous. And then there was a gentleman, um, uh, then there was a gentleman called Boggy Bill. And I guess you can guess what his work was. And uh, there were, Kelly, who was a, um, a crazy Irishman who had worked on ships before and then got the job to put the tent up and down as the tent master. And um, a disabled gentleman who used to do the advanced publicity and uh, go th from town to town, the advanced publicity was putting up the posters and putting up arrows as to how you get there. And there was a guy called Medini who was um, ex extravagant extravagantly gay contortionist who was told, too old to do his business anymore but was making costumes. And I could go on, you know. It was absolutely fantastic. The mixture of the people that were there and um, the acceptance that there was um, uh, in this community for all of these people. And I thought, this is fantastic. Oh, I forgot, there were the Falcons. There were five in fact, they were the first black South African um, circus troupe. And they'd managed to get out of South Africa and now had found themselves in a very cold uh, English mud show. And um, I later found out that, because they always sung Michael Jackson songs. And I always wondered why until I later found out that the Falcons was the name of Michael Jackson's Jackson 5 before they became the Jackson 5. So all these people, we trained for, fi for five weeks and we made a show. And I don't, in that time, there was no, t it, we were working so much, we were working seven days a week and 14, 15 hours a day, and hurting because all of us 14 civilians were learning to do many different circus acts and uh, uh, learning about makeup and uh, learning how to be on a stage. And it was really, really a, a crash course. And so, I had no time really to reflect on what I was doing apart from really hoping I was going to make it because I really, I loved it. I loved all of these people and this crazy life and it was a pretty brutal life. Um, and totally changing, wa washing outside, uh, and it was in the winter, washing outside with a cold water standpipe, you know, and, uh, and living in a little bunk wagon where uh, you're only heating. <laughs> Your only heating was the, the, the you had a, like a gas ring in there, but unfortunately the bed was lower than the gas ring. So to get your feet warm, you'd have to lie on your bed and put your feet in the air. <laughs> it was a whole change of life. So off we set, and true to, uh, true to uh, form, Jerry Cottle, who was uh, the circus director, um, we all were either leaving, driving trucks when we left, or we were um, city, uh, trailer mate in the truck and um, reading the directions. So we set off, uh, we didn't set off, before we set off, he said, okay, you're, and your tractor and trailer's outside. And he'd taken me at my word thinking I could drive a tractor and trailer, but a, a truck tractor and trailer. And so I step outside and I have a 59 foot load with a tractor and a trailer. <laughs> and I said, no, 59 foot and nine inches. And I said, Jerry, this is totally illegal. You know, I mean, I have a, a driving license for a car. And he said, don't worry, it's 59 foot nine. If it's 60 foot, you know, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and so off we, set, off we set down the road. We were going to Bath, and I don't know if anybody knows Bath. Um, beautiful city, um, about 60, 70 miles from London. And uh, I had two of the Falcons, Rodney and Ivan, these young acrobats with me who were like supposedly reading my directions. Luckily, I was going towards home, so I knew how to get there. So we, when you get to Bath, you come off the motorway, and it's a very windy road going down to the city. Not lit that much. Anyway, the lights gave out halfway down. And then I have Rodney on one side on one of the running boards. I have Ivan on the other side on the running board. I don't really know how to drive a truck and a trailer. 
and we're going down a hill, and they're telling me if I'm getting close to that side, and he's telling me if I'm getting close to this side. <laughs> this was the point, deciding point in my life, when I said, I don't think I'm going back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just too much, you know, it was like everything you could dream of. And so we get down the hill, and, and the police arrive, of course, and I'm like, oh my God, oh no. And of course, you got circus written along the side, and they like put their lights on, they lead you to the site. I mean, this is insane, you know. <laughs> so, this was points when I realized that, that I really loved that life and that I really loved the acceptance, the mixture of cultures and the acceptance within, within this. Then we came to do shows, and um, the thrill of doing a show when you, you know, six weeks um, out of your office was, was quite incredible, and realizing that that certainly isn't easy. It was easier to drive the truck. Um, to amuse people was um, a, a totally different ball game. And another thing, um, Another thing that I, I realized was that all of these people from all of these different countries, they didn't need to speak the same language because um, their language was, was a physical, uh, physical performance. And, excuse me, having traveled now all over the world, um, performing and also recruiting artists, I've realized what a what a huge community there is amongst these artists and, and a huge um, feeling of fellowship amongst all of these people, which is a truly, truly wonderful thing. If only that um, you work sometimes in shows and you're working when the countries are at war with each other and um, politically don't agree with each other or, or, or with... Um, religions that don't agree with each other or many other conflicts, colors or, or colors or gender or sexual preference and it's, it's a really accepted thing and the proof of, in a way, the proof of who you are and um, your integrity is to be able to function inside of that and the final proof is obviously if you can go out on the stage and, um, and amuse the public. It's always a very testing time when it's always a very testing time when you come to do a contract with a new circus, and you know that if you've got a lot of the artists coming to watch you, you're either the worst or the best act. And this is always before the premiere, so you never know because the public aren't there. Um, many anecdotes about circus. The circus, uh, so just to finish with traditional circus, this is more or less traditional circus. Traditional circus at the moment is in a, in a, in a deep decline um, due to a number of reasons, uh, television being one. And um, I think variety in circus, the moment that, that we could film acts, it became a problem because essentially people were doing one act and as soon as the act was seen um, on the television by many, many people, this became a big problem. The Cirque du Soleil have certainly reinvented circus and re inspired circus and replenished what is a fantastic art form. Um, they've taken what, what has been dying and is dying around the world through overpopulation, through the war coming down, subsidies ending for the Eastern Bloc, um, circus schools, through traditional circuses like overplaying themselves and never changing, through the directors, never putting money back into the shows we're investing. They've taken all of that and they've gone deeper into what I call this. I'm going to get really boring in a minute because this is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they've brought something back to life, which is a fantastic thing. And the, the, the basic elements haven't changed whatsoever. It's, it's still the same. It's still people doing acts. There's production value and there's allegoric images, um, there's tri original music written, and there's a re also um, um, a respect for different cultures and involving different cultures and also involving different art forms, bringing taiko drums and, and, 
um, teaching artists how to play taiko drums or working with masks, um, being able to dance. And through doing this, they ha have in fact created uh, uh, a new kind of circus, which other people now are, are picking up on and being inspired by, and also a new kind, new kinds of artists, which for anything to succeed, um, you have to invest in the artists. And to invest in the artists, you have to invest then in the teachers. Artists are, uh, are asked to do a lot more these days um, in, in the shows that we're making. They're being asked to perform. If I'd auditioned, I would. What I'd said in the beginning to get into Jerry Circus would never have happened. Okay. Would never have worked this time because the level now that. Um, needed to be in a Cirque du Soleil show or, like I say, other shows has risen dramatically. I think this is healthy for the business um, in general and certainly one of the biggest pleasure, uh, pleasures for myself is working with these fabulous artists, one who's going up into the air. I'm going to speak a little bit afterwards, but what I'd like to do as words I don't think can really express what we do is to show you a little bit of what we do.
Charles Chassé. Thank you, Bernie. Try and describe that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Um, so this is one of the favorite, I mean, uh, out of all of the work I do, um, I'm creative director for the Cirque du Soleil for the first time um, for a new show, as we started discussing. But um, this is absolutely one of my, my passions, um, because I know that it speaks to people. Um, myself and Isabel worked um, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, over quite a long time to, to make this. Um, obviously, a costume designer and lighting designer and composer. And um, <clears throat> from, I know for myself, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know that I could create together with people to do things like that. And, uh, very happy that um, I could drive a tractor and trailer. <laughs> that, um, so Isabel um, started working when she was as a contortionist um, when she was really quite young. I don't know, uh, is it Isabel still there? Maybe 10 years old. And um, was working in a, a, one of the first Cirque shows, Nouvelle Experience, with another three contortionists and had only worked on the floor until we we decided that we would work together in the air. So it was a very new challenge for herself, and uh, I'm very happy for her, and uh, she's doing fantastically. And um, at some point, I'm sure she will want to uh, have a new challenge. But through what I was saying is all of the training and development and the, the, the tools that we try to give people to learn not just to be, uh, how to be directed on the stage, but also how to create themselves. Um, because people will work with the Cirque du Soleil, we will create shows. Um, but afterwards, I think for, for our whole business to try and avoid maybe what happened with, uh, and is happening with traditional circus, is to uh, these people, the, the future creators of shows. So hopefully we're getting our, our future, a bright future. Um, <clears throat> yeah, one year ago in London, I'm going to finish soon, um, um, Guy Lalevarté, who's the founding president or the owner of the Cirque du Soleil, um, felt, uh, asked me to come and meet him. So I went to meet him and he asked me to work on another project and it was very symbolic for himself that that um, they'd had a number of successes with, with their shows, with the creative team that, that they were using. Um, Franco and Gilles Saint-Croix, who was the first, I'm the second creative director, he was the first, he's got big shoes to fill, um, to create a new show. It's sure the Cirque was gonna create a new show, but um, as with um, circus, when you perform circus, you have to take risks, whether it's uh, a risk of falling or a risk if you're a juggler of looking like a, a, a klutz or and then having to be very human and try again or there's always risks involved every time that you go out on the stage and fundamentally that is uh, an appeal in circus and it's something that um, Guy has applied uh, to, together with his original creators <clears throat> with regards to their shows because my goodness the investment that they put into the circus with no guarantee, with a big risk, and being like a complete front runner, and it paid off, obviously. And it paid off, and the company got bigger, and it's a corporation now, and there's quite a number of shows in the world. And so he decided, okay, he wants to go back to, he wants to go back to the, the point of taking a risk again, and that is to ask me, who'd never been a creative director, done many positions in the circuit, from knocking in stakes to being an artist and all the way through, to assume the position of um, a creative director to find a new director and a new creative team totally, and to make a show that is different than the last shows. I said, yes, that would be great. <laughs> then uh, it was probably about two months later, and I thought, well, how do you make a show that's different, that's already different than everything else? 
it's a, so this is my challenge and my uh, inson insomnia right now. Um, and um, we've just started creation and uh, we have created meetings at the moment and I think it is taking a path which will be um, really different. And I know that the bar is very high and the risks are very high also because the bigger you get, the, bigger, the more press are there to help you maybe if you stay being good, but otherwise they'll flatten you just like that. So that's me, Andrew Watson, and um, this is what I'm doing. I couldn't explain that in words, I'm sorry. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murphy.